Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Radio Lums. My name is Mustafa Khan and the show today is Providence. Over the past few episodes and weeks, we've covered discussions ranging from technology and the environment to our place in them. And as you know, on Providence, we're always discussing the future. We're discussing the questions and the obstacles and the issues and challenges humanity will face in the future. Today, we have a very special episode for you. especially because of our very special guest today the president of the feminist society at lums ms ghazia nadeem thank you for having me um i'm really excited to have a well good discussion with you about this it's exciting to have you here especially because this is a great opportunity for you know inter society collaboration at lums so ghazia as you know in on providence uh, i'm always trying to talk with uh, experts and professors and student leaders about the questions we have so you know we had discussions with ssc professors on the environment And so the topic for today is about the history and future of feminist movements in Pakistan and that's why we have you as our guest for today. So in this discussion we're going to be discussing we're going to be tracing the beginnings and the continuation of feminism in Pakistan and the different obstacles and challenges it has faced mainly but because on providence like I just mentioned we talk always about the future once we've done that we will be talking about how we see feminism in Pakistan moving forward. how we see it facing and overcoming challenges and obstacles which it has done in the past and how it will continue to do so so uh hazi moving on if we're ready to start a discussion from where do we situate the beginning of a homegrown feminist movement in pakistan does it precede partition and independence or is it something that started afterwards um first off i will give a disclaimer that um my opinions on this subject are opinions right i will obviously give based on what i've learned and what i know but feminism is very opinion based um and so is mine um so a lot of the things that you would hear from me are going to be my own thoughts and pros whatever i've been thinking about it so according to what i know most of it started after the partition if we start talking about feminist movements in the subcontinent obviously there were a lot of them right but then if you think about feminist movements that are inherent to pakistan those obviously began after the partition and very quickly after the partition um after the partition violence in pakistan uh, in the in punjab with we've all heard and we've all read about it there's a lot of violence i think almost 75000 women were raped and that is just the a very government figure so i think 2 years after the partition uh, there was this committee made called the women's welfare committee and fatma jana made it um she was one of the founders of it and then that uh, transitioned into the women's welfare society i think and then to the all pakistan women's association which is a very important political movement that still remains to this day and the point of that was to empower the women who were hurt by partition and then it slowly transitioned into a political movement i think in the beginning it was supposed to only it was supposed to help women who didn't have any jobs at that time so nursing was something that became out of that movement and then became political All right so uh, that's an interesting you know incident that you mentioned uh so do you feel that like you mentioned uh Fatma Jana who founded the association which is also one of the founders of the country itself and as you mentioned you know thousands of women uh, gave huge sacrifices and suffered huge losses during partition and the creation of Pakistan so do you think that women were dealt a short hand relative to the role and the importance that they had in the creation of Pakistan itself definitely and Fatma Jana best example of that she was one of the founders but she wasn't allowed to participate in pol- politics for a while and then she herself chose to not participate um and when she made the Pakistan Women's Association she started a secret radio station i thought that would be really fun for you guys as uh, she started it and that helped her come out of that and then she uh, participated in the elections the presidential elections in 1965 i mean if you have someone who's on such a high position and she's the one also being dealt a short hand you can imagine what was happening to the women right and the violence part of it all there were women who were displaced and they had nowhere to go we've all when we talk about feminism there's two ways of talking about it one you talk about the people in power and then secondly you talk about the people who are on ground right so fatma jana the women in power and then you have people who have no way to go because they have been kidnapped and then raped and now they have children and the sikhs do not want to accept them because they are muslim muslim women now and the muslims do not want to accept them because they are now tainted by the sikh men so you have everyone basically struggling in this nation that was supposed to be for them but it's currently only for the men right and like you mentioned you talk about people in positions of power and then people on the ground and in both situations women are at a relatively lower you know yes. stature than men in pakistan and in most of the world over 
So, uh, Ghazia, when did the label of feminism itself and the sort of, you know, we obviously um, fighting for women's rights and all of that is a constant thing. But when did the label of feminism itself become usable in Pakistan? You mentioned some of the associations Fatma Jinnah uh, created. Would you classify them as, you know, overtly feminist or would you use a different classification for them? I would say they're feminist movements because... Th- that's the character they have, right? For me, feminist movements are any political movements that are for the empowerment of any marginalized communities. But I think the labels actually started coming into play after Zia's period. In Zia's period, um, when he came out with uh, all the laws that essentially negated women's legal space, a lot of feminist movements started then, and then they labeled themselves as feminists. Um, they were, it's really fascinating. They were like, there are three main labels used even right now in Pakistan. So there's liberal feminisms. Then there's just people who will say that we are feminists. They don't use any of those labels. And there's this Nisaism, which comes from Quran ki joayata, Surah Nisa. It comes from that, that word, and it's basically a form of feminism that uses Islam to explain feminism and how it's hurting the current use of islam is hurting women and that also came out within zia's period and you still see that in organizations and stuff so that's the three different labels still used in pakistan all right that's that's great and we're going to be delving more into uh mm-hmm. you know the different classifications of feminism in pakistan uh in a bit after our break but another thing that's great that you mentioned is that a lot of you know overtly feminist movements and associations grew out of the time of zia's rule when you know there was a lot of repression against women especially and a lot of legislative action which sought to institutionalize that uh so leading off from that what are some of the landmark events or uh creations in the feminist history of pakistan a lot of these things happened during zia's period so would you like to expand on some of these associations some of these you know uh situations or incidents that happened in some protests or something i think the best way to explain landmark events is there's three phases of Pakistani feminism. There's a partition, post-partition, there's Zia's period, and then there's post-Zia's period. And in Zia's period, I think the biggest one that, the most landmark movement that propelled all of feminist movements was the um, legislation where Zina became an act for which you could get publicly executed and you'd have to, people had the right, people were given the right to basically put, I don't know how to word this, We've, we all know about this Zana laws, but after those, Women's Democratic Forum became active, and then they started actively, uh, when women were being forced to go to jail and sent to prisons for existing essentially, for not being a part of Zia's perfect imagination of what a woman should be, that's I think the biggest landmark movement that propelled most of feminist movements in Pakistan. If you come to post Zia's period and currently, it's, it's too much into the present, but I think currently, Aurat March has become another landmark movement. Beach May, it's become very calm because they have women, women have then from the political sphere, they moved to NGOs and work like that. So, for, in my opinion, there's been two the Zana laws and then now Aurat March. All right, great. And of course, there are too many to really name and go into, and countless who will, you know, forever remain nameless and no one will know their stories. But are there any particular women? or individuals that you would like to talk about in particular who you feel have really, you know, contributed a lot to the growth and survival of feminist movements in Pakistan? The one that comes to the top of my mind is Begum Rana Lakat Ali Khan. She was the wife of uh, the Prime Minister of Pakistan who was killed. Um, and she, alongside Fatma Ali Jinnah, basically became the founder of uh, Pakistan's Women's Association and then became the first Muslim uh, women delegate to the United Nations. She was one of the fiercest women in the feminist history of Pakistan. Of course, later on, you have wonderful, wonderful women, and I can't name all of them. But she was someone who Pakistan had just been created her husband had just been killed but she did not let that stop it at all and she like ran this covert operation to get Fatma Jinnah into politics to get women in Karachi get them jobs basically do all these wonderful things and no one talks about her which is the reason I bring her up as well you have Asma Jahangir wonderful woman people talk about her people know her but this one lady who did so much for the country and for women of the country she was the one who got women into the military into the paramilitary forces so the reason we have the first female general of pakistan you could even like trace that back to her because she was the one who pushed for the legal legality of having women in the medical fields of army so i would like to mention her i think yeah and and i think that's a great choice because like you mentioned you know asma jangir is 
you know one of the greatest uh, in the in history and a lot of people know about her but i didn't know about uh, begum rana laqat ali khan and her contribution so that that was great and i'm sure a lot of our listeners will you know not have known that either now we're going to take the providence look at it sort of look at the future of it look by looking at the challenges that feminism in pakistan continues to face today where these challenges come from and how it is combating these so ghazia what are the strongest challenges that feminism in pakistan faces and you as a staunch feminist that you have personally faced and which avenues of society or otherwise do these challenges come from i think the biggest challenge for feminism in pakistan is the structural roots of what has become pakistan right i mean of course there's issues on top as well but what's the the biggest problem remains that women are made to be the the boundaries of the of what forms the nationalist identity right women are the carriers of the izzat women are carriers of our identities essentially so in doing that you objectify a woman into being an identity and not a woman herself and most of the problems then that come are i think revolve around that for example we have laws about property right inheritance all those things all of those exist because women are not given the same legal position or given just the same i would say even the same position in society because the idea of a woman being the safe keeper of her identities is a lot more comfortable than women being active in public spaces so for example one of the biggest problems in pakistan is to me the problems to me is that i cannot be out in public and be there comfortably right it seems very small but when you understand how much that limits your everyday life if i need to go buy something i need to have someone with me who is male or i would have someone who can go pick it up for me that's that's just it limits you as a person that happens because women can't exist in the public sphere that happens because having your private in the public is something that is extremely against the pakistani culture right and like then there's so many more problems there is the there's the transgender laws we have an entire marginalized community who we don't acknowledge as a part of our society then there is the fact that a woman's witness counts as only half as that of a man right so it's like almost in every sphere of life you have women being downgraded to a second citizen and you cannot exist in a society like that comfortably and then you have so many instances where women get killed for doing the bare minimum and i don't think people realize how traumatizing that is to grow up in in a society where you grow up and you're told that if you don't do this it's right to kill you on your killings all of those things like there's big things there's small things all of those things i think exist because our society currently is not ready to give us the identity of or the safety of being actual citizens and actual living human beings um and that's just not limited to pakistan that's across the world but yeah and that's what we try to fight when, when we do aurat march um when we go out in the street we take up the public sphere and that bothers people even if you don't have the so called vulgar posters or all of that what bothers people is why are these women out in public doing things that we should be taking up all this space so i think yeah all right all right great and uh so when we talk about such things in pakistan uh it's always you know a taboo topic and everything so and in this question i'm not too fond of the words that we're using so i'm going to use air quotes uh, you can't see me but i'm using air quotes here how do we reconcile feminism with and i'm not fond of this word but traditional society so you mentioned that most of the challenges come from the structural roots of what our society has become so reconciling feminism and feminist ideals with this is reconciliation even needed is it a question of compromise or is it conflict and you mentioned the different classifications of feminism in pakistan and i think that'll be useful to talk about that in this context so would you like to expand on this i think it's really fascinating because a lot of theoretical debate about this talks about how one way that people reconcile with this notion is that there was a golden area of islam and golden period of society when women were given all these rights right now it is the women's fault that fault that they do not have these rights because they want western individualism um and it's really really fascinating because you see that even like in normal politics right and i think that makes me think that maybe reconciliation is not possible because if you are not willing to understand that there is a problem right now that needs to be solved and instead thinking ki nahi ek there was a golden period and that needs to be brought back and that is the only way we can give women rights i would say i don't think that's that is a possible way to deal with it the only thing that i can say we can do is as individuals give women the respect that they need and do 
the bare minimum of being good people to them because there needs to be a structural change in our society but where should that cultural change go right do we want to be like in a western society not really because our tra- traditions are not just like constructive to gender but like we have traditions there is no need to let go of them but also we don't want to follow the west and we don't want to let go of our own traditions so i think for what i figured out is that the best way is to just understand that women around you are just as worthy of everything else as you are and be willing to give them space i think men get have to play the most important role in this because you need to be willing to give them space and that is something that most people are not comfortable doing you need to be giving me the same space that you have right now in your schools in your offices in everywhere and that's the only way that i or support them in orat march and support them in their feminism as well i think that's the best way to go about it for now yeah and i feel like a lot of the times the debate around feminism in pakistan just boils down to hanging on to tradition and fully accepting yeah. western society and like you mentioned absolutely it's that that's not the dichotomy that's here right it's it's not a polar choice there are ways out of it but of course people don't want to let yes. go of things and don't want to change things and it's always easy to you know i think sort of stir up opposition in people by pointing to complete alternatives yeah. and say that there's nothing in between it's either this or that and you're absolutely right about the role that everyone has to play in making pakistan and the world a more positive and encouraging place for women but not just women for everyone so uh ghazi talking about this and you've mentioned a bit of this but how do you see the future of feminist movements in pakistan in terms of the obstacles that you faced up till now how do you see them changing or do you see them changing in the near future and further on and how do you see feminism progressing in pakistan i think there's so much hope for feminism in pakistan we have a rich history right we might have gone to sail for a few years in between but um with the recent orat march and i think last weekend there was uh, the murat march which was the transgender march that happened in sindh right um and with the coming out of movies like joyland you see people taking up the politics again right making it their own instead of leaving it up to politicians and when people start doing that then you know there is hope movements in the future even right now when you for example look at the murat march it was it was so beautiful it was so political right it was trans people taking up their space after the transgender act had come out there was um zulfikar ali bhutto junior was there who is the grandson of the actual zulfikar ali bhutto um and you had all these people standing there and telling them that you deserve everything and you will do it and people had come out right when people start actually coming out into movements and becoming a part of it that's when you know that there is good future to be had um when people are scared into staying into their homes um or not even willing to put in the effort that's like when you realize that maybe this isn't the correct time but i think right now is possibly the best time for feminist movements in pakistan and they have started there's so many feminist groups in pakistan there's actually um i think next year there's going to be a huge event where all these different political movements sit together and there's going to be a panel talk about it i think so you have people collaborating and organizing and they're angry which is very important for feminist movements and all political movements they have the anger they have the people they have the organization so i think there's just so much wonderful things that can come out of this and most likely will because whenever i look at orat march and the sense of belonging that i feel there the discussions that happen around it right within female circles because you see this understanding that you have to include the working women you know you have to include its students and the marginalized communities that's when you realize that this isn't just a fight of the elite women anymore which was in the beginning like a slight tan- tangent but i think dr kirwani talks about it in her like senior thesis or something that in pakistan there are two types of women that talk about feminism one is the elite right and then the other is the working women the working women do not have the words for it but they are the most active about it and then you have the elite but there's always been this huge gap between the two but now i feel like there's lesser of a gap um sure the languages we use might just be slightly post colonial but um even now like i keep thinking about the orat march and you had people of all types there and when you can go beyond all those structural things then i think there's a lot of hope to be had for pakistan i, I think that's great khazia and truly we hope that you know We really Pakistan does live up to the potential that you see in it and the optimism. And you're right in the way that you know feminism has started becoming less about the elite thing and the, it has taken them in its stride and really, you know, improved on these things. And so I think we all collectively are hoping for a brighter future for Pakistan in 
all the different you know problems it faces so thank you so much ghazi that was a great talk uh this was extremely enlightening and extremely helpful uh we hope you enjoyed listening to our talk show for today uh this was providence with mustafa khan you were listening to radio lums thank you